2 Timothy chapter 1. That's the scripture we're going to read now. 2 Timothy 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Saviour Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, Thou knowest very well. Amen. Second Timothy 1 verse 1. That's our text. Second Timothy 1 verse 1. We're not actually even going to be able to complete it all this morning. But I'll read the whole now. Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. The rest next week, Lord willing. According to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Beloved, now that we are all, or almost all, it wasn't possible for everyone to be with us today or even tonight, but now that we're pretty much all back again together, It's time to start a new series in God's Word, an exposition of sacred scripture. To introduce Paul's second canonical letter to Timothy, I'm going to mention just four words. Pastoral, it's a pastoral epistle. Prison, it's a prison epistle. Martyr, it's the epistle of one soon to be martyred and last it's Paul's last canonical epistle and if this sounds somewhat familiar to you it should because these are the four key words that I mentioned in a recent 
sermon, exactly the same four words. In a recent sermon on 2 Timothy 2 verse 19, on the text, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and that everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. I've been considering preaching on 2 Timothy chapter 1 for some time, several weeks, waiting until all or almost all are back together. And during that time, my mind turned, influenced by some other things too, to 2 Timothy 2 verse 19. So I don't need to say too much about the very helpful words. A pastoral epistle written as 2 Timothy, like 1 Timothy and Titus, to preachers of the word of God in the office of evangelist. A prison epistle, Paul was in jail yet again for the gospel's sake. A martyr epistle, because he knows that he's soon to die for the truth of Jesus and his last canonical epistle. And I want you to bear this in mind when studying this book, 2 Timothy, and this chapter, 2 Timothy 1, which is the subject of this series, and this verse... 2 Timothy 1 verse 1, or rather the first half of it, which is the subject of this sermon. And I'm going to bring it up because these key things about this epistle shed light upon the book, the chapter, and different things that we're going to consider as we work our way, Lord willing, through these 18 verses. Let's consider them. Paul's apostolic office. First, it's rich meaning. Second, its eternal source and third the bit we're not going to get to and I decided to leave it out it's crucial conformity next week for that I say Lord willing Paul's apostolic office its rich meaning and its eternal source let's start with the word itself apostle comes from the Greek verb to send So an apostle is a sent one. In a non-technical sense, if you send your son to the local shop to buy a newspaper, you could say he's an apostle. He is a sent one in a non-technical, non-doctrinal sense. Anyone who is sent becomes an apostle in that lower case way. But we're dealing here with the technical, theological sense, that is, one sent by Jesus Christ in the highest ecclesiastical office. An office that's not political, it's not a business office, it's not a family office, it's a church office. One sent by Christ in that distinct Christian office. Paul, an apostle, you could almost capitalize it, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And as one sent by Christ, Paul was authorized by him, equipped by him, owned by him, and obedient to him. He was sent and he did the bidding of the one who sent him. All that, though, doesn't tell us too much about the nature of the authority and power of the apostolic office. So we start now with the basics beyond the word which itself means sent. The office of an apostle includes two main elements. First, there is the authority and power to preach and teach God's word. That's what an apostle centrally does. Prophets and evangelists preach and teach in their temporary extraordinary office pastors teachers in their permanent ordinary office do too but the preaching and teaching of apostles is by direct revelation from God and it is infallible so at what the apostles teach as regards doctrine and life sacraments and discipline worship and church government is all infallibly true and received directly from the source of Jesus Christ, the chief prophet of the church himself, and not merely by looking at scripture and explaining and applying. 
And of course, the preaching and teaching of the apostles centers in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the atoning work of the Son of God for our salvation. In this, the apostles, teaching by direct revelation and infallibly, are on a par with the prophets and evangelists. Prophets, certainly, and probably evangelists, too, taught by direct revelation, or at least sometimes they did, and they taught infallibly. But pastors and teachers do not teach infallibly. That's good for you to hear. You never for a minute believed that I was infallible. That's good. And you never for a minute believed that I got direct revelation. We receive it indirectly through the scriptures. It's still revelation though when it comes from the word of God. Preaching and teaching. The central thing about the apostolic office. And besides preaching and teaching. And that divine authority and power given to them. Apostles also received God-given authority and power to perform miracles. Not willy-nilly, silly miracles like you read of in the Middle Ages and that have attached themselves, for instance, to St. Patrick, but miracles in the service of the gospel of grace and in validating their, that is, the apostles' authority. These miracles... And you can see them in the book of Acts and in other places in the epistles. These miracles included miracles of healing, probably the one with which we're most familiar, miracles of exorcising demons, and sometimes even miracles of judgment, such as Peter's miraculous slaying of Ananias and Sapphira, in Acts 5, when they lied to the Holy Ghost by lying to church officers. And Paul's striking Elymas the sorcerer blind in Acts 13, when he tried to turn away Sergius Paulus from the message proclaimed during Paul's first missionary journey. And in this, apostles performing real miracles, not forgeries, are obviously far higher than pastors and teachers and though prophets and probably evangelists too wrought miracles the apostles are greater in their miracle working power than the New Testament apostles the New Testament prophets and evangelists some further points then beyond preaching and teaching and miracle working as the main authority and power of the apostles some further points about this apostolic office that help us grasp it more fully. First of all, the office of apostle was the number one inclusive office in the church. And it's so inclusive in the church that it basically includes all the other New Testament offices. That is, if you are an apostle, which of course you're not, so I'll rephrase the sentence. An apostle is automatically, you could say, an elder. Peter says that in 1 Peter 5 verse 1. I, Peter, who am also an elder. He said that when he addresses the elders. If you are an apostle, included in that is the office of elder. Leading, guiding, overseeing the church. The office of the apostle embraces too, basically, the office of a deacon. And when you read 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 on Christian giving, you'll see there that Paul, in his teaching, and in other places in Acts that he mentions also in other epistles, even brings an offering to the poor church in Jerusalem. He's working, basically, as a deacon. So an apostle includes more or less, elder and deacon. And it includes basically the office of pastor, teacher as well. Because a, 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 an apostle, Paul even uses the words in verse 11, an apostle is a preacher and a teacher of the Gentiles. 
So all the church offices in this congregation, they're all basically in all of the apostles anyway. And an evangelist, an evangelist, that's included, all that the evangelist does is basically included in an apostle. And a prophet, when he speaks the word of God directly by infallible inspiration, the apostles do the same thing. So it is the inclusive office. It's all there. And not only does this office of apostle include all the other special offices in the church, but it is also, and this follows from the previous point, it is also the highest New Testament office. It's higher than an evangelist because an evangelist, I'm talking now biblically, not talking about the way the word's used in the 21st century, an evangelist in the Bible is a sort of assistant to an apostle. Like Timothy and Titus, whereby Paul would come in, evangelize an area, and move on, and then leave it to an evangelist as his assistant to oversee these new churches and by God's grace bring them on and appoint point elders there so in that an evangelist serves an apostle an apostle is a higher church office bearer and it's the same with the new testament prophets the phrase apostles and prophets is used at least three times in the epistle to the church at ephesus and in all three instances the order is apostles and prophets apostles and prophets Apostles and prophets in chapters 2, 3, and 4. And obviously, and I have always seen, to be an apostle is a lot higher than to be an elder or a minister or a deacon. It's the inclusive New Testament office. It's the highest office. And it is the universal office. By this I mean that the authority and power of the apostle to teach, to perform miracles, it's throughout the world. And it's authority and power to institute churches wherever, to oversee churches wherever they may be, and all of them. So if Paul in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 28 speaks of the care of all the churches which fell upon him daily. And so it is also that Paul teaches that in that office of apostle, he has authority from Christ to receive remuneration or payment from all churches, which church office bearers don't today. That is, if Paul in his missionary journey <coughs> was in Thessalonica, or in Ephesus, or in Rome, it was the responsibility of those churches to support him. Now we also know that Paul lived very frugally, that oftentimes he would forego the right of the churches supporting him, that he did this strategically and deliberately in some cases in order to expose the false prophets who were in it for money. So he would serve in a church and say, I will not take any money from you, in part to starve the false apostles and to expose them as money-grubbing thieves. But he says in many places that he had the authority to receive financial support. My point is the universality of his office in terms of teaching, in miracles, in instituting churches, in overseeing all the churches, in remuneration from all the churches. And so the apostles were itinerant church leaders. That is, they moved around. They were at the very least mobile Unlike elders and deacons, which work in one church, a minister probably moves a bit round a bit more and that he will preach in different congregations. But an apostle, he is always on the go, staying in some places, as you see in Paul's letters, maybe for 18 months or a year or two years, but moving on and spreading and building up and appointing evangelists like Titus in Crete and Timothy as here in Ephesus to bring on the local churches or the area churches in his absence. An inclusive office, it includes all the other New Testament offices, the highest office, it's above them all, 
and a universal office in the sense that he has universal jurisdiction. It is some office. And in keeping with all this is the nature of the call to the apostolate or the apostleship. Apostles received a direct and wonderful call from Jesus Christ himself. The eleven apostles, we'll forget now about Judas, the traitor apostle. The eleven apostles spent three years being with Jesus, seeing and hearing all that he did, touching him too, First John says, in terms of realizing the reality of his incarnation. Three years with him throughout all his public ministry, seeing and hearing what he did, and they were chosen to be the twelve, a distinctive group, higher in a sense than all the other disciples, lowercase, who were with him as his apostles. That's a direct, wonderful call from Jesus himself. Paul, well, Jesus Christ appeared to him in a brilliant light from heaven and commissioned him, sending him especially to the Gentiles. A direct wonderful call and even Matthias the replacement apostle in Acts chapter 1 we're told that he spent three years with Jesus right from Christ's baptism all the way up to his ascension and then there was a specific choice of God out of the two men that fulfilled the criteria of being with Jesus for all the time of his public ministry out of the two men there wasn't an election whereby the twelve the other eleven disciples apostles or even the 120 in the upper room filled in ballots. But instead there was a casting of the lot so that God would pick which of these two would be the new apostle taking the place of Judas who fell as prophesied in the Old Testament and predicted by Jesus and went, as the Bible says, to his own place. And this truth that the apostles had a direct and wonderful call fits with everything we know about the nature of their office. Because if you have an extraordinary office, and the apostles were the most extraordinary office bearers in the New Testament under Christ, then you need an extraordinary call to it. The nature of the call fits the nature of the office. Today we have ordinary church offices, permanent church offices, deacons, ministers, and elders, and it's an ordinary office, so there's an ordinary call to it. There's a vote. It's very ordinary, you might say, but God is working through that too. Extraordinary office, extraordinary call. Ordinary office, ordinary call. And when you have as is the case of the apostles, the authority and power to preach and teach and perform miracles in an office that includes all the other New Testament offices, that's the highest New Testament office, and that is, properly explained and defined, universal, then you need an extraordinary, that is, direct and wonderful call to it. And this also fits with other things that we haven't as yet considered. If we have the apostle up here, the highest New Testament office, embracing all the others, universal in scope, and necessitating an extraordinary call, then this office of apostle includes what we may only describe as apostolic labors. You can't have somebody who's called to be an apostle and he sits around on the back of his palms in a chair doing nothing or laboring half-heartedly. The apostles worked very hard. We could talk about, if you understand the term correctly here, and I don't mean anything demeaning, Herculean labors. That's what the apostles engaged in. And the apostle Paul said in one place, I labored more abundantly than they all. And that was saying something because the apostles, the other ones, were not slackers. In 2 Corinthians 6, 
and 2 Corinthians 11 deal with this. And if somebody wants to say they're an apostle, we say, we're your apostolic labors. We say a lot more, and we're going to say more about it. But to be an apostle, you need apostolic labors. You need apostolic fruit as well. 2 Corinthians 3 and 2 Corinthians 10 deal with this. And Paul says, if someone seeks a, an epistle to prove that I'm an apostle, you congregation, he said in Corinth, you're my epistle. I don't need a letter in my back pocket that says, look, I'm Paul and I'm an apostle. You're an epistle, known and read of all men. And I have epistles throughout the whole Roman world. Apostolic piety fitted in with all this too. 2 Corinthians 4 and 2 Corinthians 6. You can't say, I'm an apostle and live like the devil or even live a loose Christian life or even live a very godly Christian life. You need apostolic piety to attest to that office. And along with this too comes apostolic suffering and patience and perseverance. And chapters 1, 6 and 11 and other places of 2 Corinthians deal with this. And I've quoted 2 Corinthians as proof for all of those things. Apostolic labors, piety, suffering and fruit. Because 2 Corinthians is the epistle in which Paul deals with the false apostles. So he has to explain what a true apostle is. And he points out apostolic labors, apostolic fruit, apostolic piety, apostolic suffering amongst all the other things that I've mentioned or could mention. And now look at these false prophets. False apostles, they're not, they're not the real item at all. And so we see here a couple of simple lessons. This treatment, brief as it is, about the office of apostle with which Paul begins 2 Timothy, and with which this series begins, exposes all false apostles. Not only the ones that the apostle debated and exposed especially in 2 Corinthians but all of the popes they claim to be apostles and you say no, no hold, hold on a minute hold on a minute but, a, but an apostle does this and this and this and this and this and this and you do the opposite you're not an apostle this opposes to the Mormon apostles because they reckon they have 12 of them and you see what they do and what they teach and you say that's not an apostle and it opposes the thousands of Pentecostal and charismatic and non-charismatic apostles. Because once somebody understands what a real apostle is, then all of the counterfeits are very easy to identify. And if someone came to you with a $20 US bill, and I assume that many of you haven't seen one recently, or give a better example, a $20 Australian bill or a New Zealand or Singaporean dollar. How would you know if it's a forgery if you don't know what the real thing? And false apostles, just as false prophets and false Christians, can only get by where nobody knows what a true apostle is or a true prophet or a true Christian. And the more you set forth the true position, the more you see, you know what, all these ones that claim to be apostles. They're not even near an apostle. And it all becomes very, very clear and very simple. And by the way, here is the one easiest test of the whole lot whereby you know somebody who claims to be an apostle is not an apostle. They don't live in the first century AD. Because to be an apostle, you had to see the risen Christ. Like the eleven, like Matthias, and like Paul. And to be an apostle makes you and your teaching, as it were, part of the foundation of the church. And you only lay the foundation of the church, the New Testament church, in the first century AD. So even if you forget the whole sermon, you know that someone is a false prop, apostle from the fact that they're not in the first century AD. There aren't any apostles today. But even apart from that, all the other things that we've said about them exposes the shams and the counterfeits. And in that Paul here begins his epistle, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, we see too how Paul knows his own identity. He's in prison. But he doesn't for one minute believe that he is an offender. 
that he is a criminal, that he is an underclass. He knows I'm an apostle. I have not committed any crime whereby I should be in jail and behind bars. I'm about to be judicially executed as a criminal, but I am not a capital offender. That's not, sounds very modern, that's not who I am, although that phrase is usually used in a different way from I just use it. I am an apostle of Jesus Christ by the grace of God. I've been faithful in my office. I am in prison, though wrongfully. I'm about to be executed, and it's injustice, but I'm not raging about it. I know it's the will of God. I acquiesce in that. I'm in prison, and I'm about to be executed because I'm an apostle. And because of the apostolic gospel. And as part of my apostolic faithfulness, perseverance, and sufferings. This isn't something that detracts from my being an apostle. This is another proof that I am an apostle. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's not ashamed of writing it. And he doesn't think for one minute that what he's writing is falsified by his current position or his short-term prospects. And then he adds, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, <coughs> by the will of God. And the will of God here is not God's will of command. Paul does talk about himself as an apostle according to or by God's will of command. He does it in the very first verse of 1 Timothy, which reads, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, I, Paul, am an apostle because God in Christ commanded me, as God did in Christ in Acts 9 on the Damascus Road. Go, preach the gospel, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. That's Paul, an apostle, according to the will of God's command. The will of God in our text, 2 Timothy 1 verse 1, is the will of God's decree. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. I'm an apostle with all that entails, and we've explained some of it, more could be said. I'm an apostle, says Paul, according to God's <coughs> sovereign will. It isn't an accident that I'm an apostle. It wasn't just chance or some sort of afterthought on the part of God, some happenstance. God sovereignly and eternally willed that I be an apostle. That's some claim for a man about to die as a criminal. And when he says that he is an apostle by God's decretive will, he means that will as it comes to him as a gracious will. I'm not an apostle because I worked for it. I was better than anybody else. I'm an apostle by the mere grace and favor of a sovereign, merciful God. And this statement of Paul, that he is an apostle, by or through the will of God, isn't unique to 2 Timothy 1 verse 1. In fact, it appears in the very first verse of 4 of Paul's other epistles. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 1, Paul, an apostle by the will of God. Why does he mention it there? Several things. Paul says in the very start of 1 Corinthians that he is an apostle to remind the congregation that he's not inferior to Peter because there was the eye of Paul, eye of Cephas or Peter, an eye of Apollos thing. No, I'm an apostle by the will of God. He wasn't bumming or puffing himself up. He was explaining it simply as a fact. I am an apostle and it would be foolish of me to deny that. And these people need to know in this church that that is my position. He mentions it too in that epistle that he's an apostle by the will of God because the church's unity was affected by the false denigration of Paul and the elevation of other church leaders and factionalism. No, I'm an apostle, Peter's an apostle, we're all the servants of God, one plants, another one waters, God gives the increase, 
You need to understand the position of the church's office bearers and unite around Jesus Christ. And he explains that he's an apostle there in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 1 because of all the criticisms that he was receiving. And he's pointing out to them, I'm an apostle. Christ has called me to this. This is the will of God. And so you oughtn't engage in this evil speech or undermining of my position. In 2 Corinthians 1, the second letter to that church at Corinth, he mentions it again. I'm an apostle, he says in the first verse, through the will of God. And you understand from what we said earlier that the point he's making here chiefly is this, that I'm an apostle by the will of God over against the false apostles, particularly dealt with in chapters 10 through 13, who are putting me down, criticizing him unfairly, and who are thereby seeking to put him out of the apostleship, at least in the minds of the people in the congregation. And so he begins... I'm an apostle by the will of God. And eventually, the church in Corinth got the point. Ephesians 1 verse 1 is the third reference, as the books are arranged in our Bibles, to Paul in the first verse saying, I'm an apostle. And the point here is somewhat different from the other two Pauline letters. Because in Ephesians 1, Paul is talking about the sovereignty of God in salvation. Verse 4, he says that all of God's people were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, according to God's eternal decree. Verse 5, God predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of of his will the will of decree verse 9 God made known unto us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure which he has purposed in himself verse 11 says that we are predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will and so when Paul in the first verse of this chapter says he's an apostle by the will of God He's dealing with the eternal counsel of God in salvation and saying, my apostleship is part of this too. Different senses, different reasons why he brings out the point. And in the fourth and final example, Colossians 1 verse 1, Paul, an apostle by the will of God, there he's doing it because false doctrine was swirling around the church. I'm an apostle by the will of God. And therefore, what I'm teaching is actually the truth of the living God. And now here, in contrast to the different shades of meaning with the four other passages we've looked at, here in 2 Timothy 1 verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, he is dealing with especially his whole life in that inclusive, highest and universal office. And he's saying, I'm an apostle by the will of God in all of my labors, even though I'm in prison, even though I'm very shortly going to be martyred, and even though this is his last canonical epistle, I'm an apostle by the will of Almighty God. And this truth that Paul's apostleship from beginning to end, everything in it was according to God's sovereign will, counsel, plan, purpose and disposition and good pleasure, just to heave up the biblical words to make the point crystal clear. Just think of the very beginning of his apostleship. Where was he? He was on the Damascus Road. It was all deliberate. He's on Gentile territory. He's outside Israel. <clears throat> Very unlike all the other apostles who were called the eleven and in Galilee and then Matthias in Jerusalem. He was called on Gentile territory because he's going to become the apostle to the Gentiles. 
Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Even where God called him, fitted in with his life's work that was set before him. Why was he there? Well, because he was going to persecute Christians. Ah, yes, and so God saves Paul, not only in this place, but when he was going to do the dirtiest and most evil action of killing Christ's people and thereby persecuting Christ himself, as we quoted from Acts 26 this morning, because God is going to use the Apostle Paul as the supreme example for the church in the New Testament age to display his long suffering as a model so that everybody could see, no matter how wicked you are, even if you persecute the church of Christ itself and waste it with great energy and zeal as the Apostle Paul, God has mercy on some of those people and will turn them around. There's nobody that can say, I'm automatically ruled out because I've been too bad. Not so. And then how did Christ appear to him? In this instance, unlike all the other apostles, he appeared to Paul as the Lord from heaven. Unlike the eleven, in the days of Christ's flesh and his humiliation on earth, and even Matthias, this heavenly call. And this time too, Paul was called to be an apostle a few years after the call of the eleven, and then three years after that the call of Matthias, and then something like three years after that, according to various chronologies, the call of Paul. So that he is the one born out of due time and the sovereign purpose of God. He called him to be an apostle in Gentile land when he was going to persecute Christians as the Lord from heaven and later than all the others. Because he was Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, summing up even in his thinking the very beginning of his apostleship. And so the will of God then includes everything that happened thereafter, his, preach, his apostolic preaching and miracles, his apostolic labors and fruit, his apostolic journeys and oversight of the churches, his apostolic piety and patience and perseverance and suffering. And this same Paul, who says here in the first verse of 2 Timothy, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, even in this very letter, gives instances as older people, and especially people who are approaching death, tend to do. Referring back to earlier events in his apostolic ministry. Turn with me to a few of these. Let's begin with 2 Timothy 3 verses 10 and 11. Paul says to Timothy, Thou hast fully known my one doctrine, that's obviously got to come first, two manner of life, which dovetails with my doctrine, three purpose, because I had a direction and goal and intent with everything that I did, four faith, which I take here to be his personal subject of faith, how he believed and therefore was faithful, his long suffering in his office and in the service of the church, his charity or love, his patience or perseverance. And then he mentions his persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, Iconium and Lystra, Paul's first missionary journey. Maybe that's going to be included in tomorrow's test for the seniors in catechism. Which persecutions I endured, but out of them all God delivered me. The first missionary journey. Paul, an apostle, by the sovereign will of God. And Timothy, you know about these things. We talked about these things. You saw some of my apostolic purpose, long-suffering, charity, patience, doctrine, and so forth. Chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 deals with Paul's first trial at Rome. That is, his trial just after Acts 28, when he went to Rome to be tried before Caesar. At my first answer or apology or defense in Rome before Caesar, no man stood with me. They all let him down. They didn't want to identify with him. 
But all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and he strengthened me. So that Paul was able to present his case, win his case and be delivered. So that by me, the preaching might be fully known that I would have more time to go about preaching in the Greco-Roman world, laying the foundation of the churches, which foundation is Jesus Christ, the only foundation which can be laid, so that the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, tell us of some trouble that Paul had with a traitor or in the church, or at least an open or overt enemy. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. And Paul doesn't pray for him as he did for the weak Christians who deserted him in verse 16. He prays an imprecatory prayer. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom, Timothy, be thou ware also. For this man greatly withstood our words. He's an enemy. Be very careful when you're dealing with him. And then if we move to chapter 1, verse 15, another instance in Paul's life, moving chronologically here. This thou knowest, that all they which, which are in Asia, Turkey, especially Western Turkey, be turned away from me. The departure of some professing Christians, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. And then in chapter 4, he mentions others. Chapter 4, verse 10. Demas hath forsaken me. Again in this trial before the Roman authorities. Demas hath forsaken me. He loved this present age. He apostatized. He's gone into Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia in the middle of Turkey. Not through apostasy, but that's where God has called him to labor. Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Roughly speaking, the old Yugoslavia, somewhere around there. Only Luke is with me. And then you... Timothy, bring Mark with you when you come to visit me. Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God from its very beginnings all the way through his ministry, including some of the things about that ministry which he actually mentions in this last canonical epistle. And Paul knows, of course, too, that his apostolic office, just like his life, is very soon going to end. And that's according to the will of God, too, for he says, I am now ready to be offered as a sacrifice to God. The time of my departure from this world and entrance into the next is at hand. I have fought a good fight as an apostle. I have finished my course like a running race. I have done the track. As an apostle, I have kept the faith. There's one thing that we should add here. Regarding Paul's apostolic message of Christ crucified, his apostolic and even Herculean labors, his apostolic success and his apostolic influence, massive influence, possibly next to Jesus Christ himself. There are even secular historians who would say the second most influential man in the history of the world is the Apostle Paul. And he was an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. The greatest laborer, the greatest apostle, the greatest missionary who wrote half the New Testament. And it was all according to the will of God. It wasn't some accident. And when he says it's all according to the will of God, it's not like you and I would say, oh, it, it rained yesterday and I was hoping to cut the lawn, but that was the will of God, meaning it happened according to God's decree, but not meaning it was something terribly important. When Paul says he's an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, he is also saying, with humility, because also correctly and truly, that his being an apostle, he even realized something of it, that it wasn't at all insignificant. That it was actually a big thing in God's plan for the world. That it was a major component in the eternal purpose of Almighty God. That it was a smaller thing, doubtless, than the incarnation of the eternal Son and His cross buying liberty for all the church, obviously. But it's a lot bigger and has a much more important part in the sovereign will of God than you or I have 
or in this church has. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ in this exalted office by the will of God. This is a significant event in the history of the world and in, especially in the history of God's church. And to explore that a little bit more, when we say, quoting this passage, Paul's an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, it's not like some quote-unquote bad thing in the will of God. That's in the will of God too. An earthquake or the apostasy of Western liberal churches in themselves, those are bad things, but God works all things for good ultimately. When he says that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ and all his apostolic labors and all the apostolic influence which would come through his writings in centuries and millennia to come, he means that my apostleship in the will of God's decree is something good, holy, and delightful, not only to me, who have lived this life in fellowship with God, and not only to the church now and in the future, but something good and holy and purposeful and joyful in the heart of God, as it were. He's well pleased with this. This is God's good pleasure. And it's all pleasure and all good. And here we oppose what can only be called the ridiculous position of the apostatizing Protestant churches and Islam and the secularists, insofar as they touch on Christianity at all. And it's really so simplistic and pathetic that once you state it, you've got to shake your heads and say, you know, the arguments those people come up with, the lack of understanding, it is pitiful. It runs like this. Jesus Christ, they say, and his teaching, good. Paul and his teaching, bad. And that Paul came along and he destroyed this wonderful, simple religion of Jesus. And then when you ask them what they mean by the simple religion of Jesus, they mean left-wing, secular, or Islamic thought. Ah, so Jesus just taught exactly what you thought before you read and looked at the Bible. Of course, it's, and then the Paul came along, and instead of being the fullest, richest, most detailed expositor of Scripture, as the Bible says, who develops and unfolds what Christ taught, so that his writings and the Gospels hang together perfectly, Paul actually came along and totally misunderstood everything that Jesus said, turned the religion upside down, and just botched the whole thing. And you say, really? Really? And nobody else in the church noticed this? Peter didn't notice it. The other disciples are with Jesus for three years. Nobody, nobody around then worked it out in the 30s or 40s or 50s AD. The church came along and it took you guys to, centuries later to work this out. Just pure, unscholarly and patently biased claims. And yet it passes for wisdom. You hear it on the TV. You hear it among the supposedly religious leaders. Good religion by Jesus and Paul made a disastrous misinterpretation of the whole thing what does the text say Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ sent by Christ authorized by Christ representing Christ teaching Christ that no one ever did before or since and that it's all by the will of God and his sovereignty no accident and in his perfect good pleasure and plan before the foundation of the world because if there's one thing the enemies of Jesus Christ do they not only get it wrong they get it wrong in about as bad and completely wrong a way as they could ever do. And that's part of their depravity and madness. And we should think of this too in connection with this sermon series which has as its key text, verse 13, hold fast the form of sound or health-giving words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Hold fast the form of sound words which you've heard of me, an apostle. An apostle of Jesus Christ, all according to the will of God. Listen, cling to these things. Don't give them up and don't listen to all of those who denigrate me, Paul, as my doctrine or life. A final word of application, summing up, 
and many of these things as they impinge upon us. First of all, the teaching of our text has something to say with regard to the call of church office bearers, even permanent and ordinary ones, like pastors, deacons, and elders. To quote part of the form for the ordination of ministers, it's the same basically with elders and deacons. This is the first question that is asked of the candidates. I ask thee whether thou feelest in thy heart that thou art lawfully called of God's church and therefore of God himself. That's the key bit for us now. And therefore of God himself to this holy ministry. And the office bearer has to say, of course, yes. He feels in his heart. That's his faith. He's aware of that before God and his church. That he's lawfully called by the church and therefore of God himself. This is the equivalent in our form to the statement, Paul, an apostle, or whatever the church office may be, of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Now, it's obviously not as big a component in God's will, the election of Mr. So-and-so as an elder, or so-and-so as a minister, or so-and-so as a deacon. And it's obviously not as delightful to God and his purpose in the church, but it's still the will of God. It's decreed. It's in his plan, assuming the person isn't a heretic or a disaster. It's in his plan for the good of the church. And God says he will use the office bearer for the welfare of Christ's body. So it all those in the church, in office, currently or in the future, need to be able to say this. Yes, I believe I'm lawfully called to the church and therefore of God himself. So that I am, Mr. X, in such and such an office of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Able to say this, and believe this, and think this, so that that becomes a key part in the person's understanding of himself. So that the person isn't, to use a contemporary phrase, filled with imposter syndrome. You've probably heard about that. It's amazing that the terms that the world keeps coming up with. Crippled with imposter syndrome. I think I'm, I'm really not in an office and I'm really not a father or a mother or, or a parent or a member of the civil government. And it cripples me. The person believes that God has called me to this office. And at one level, every Christian has that about himself. You are called to the office of prophet, priest and king, whether you're in office or not. That's part of who you are. That's what you believe about yourself and the work of God in you. And here, when Paul says he's an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, that is, in the eternal purpose and good pleasure of God, I'm in this church office. He's not dealing with pride. Look at me. I'm so high and lofty. The rest of you need to grovel in the dirt. Or now is my chance to use this office to be a tyrant. But he means I have this high and holy office and it abases me so that I am never more faithful or humble or servant-like than when I actually understand this and believe this. That's what Paul's saying in this passage. And for us, we need to understand and live with respect to office bearers and the idea of office in the church, that it's not a matter of some personality contest or whipping up votes for your favorite candidate, or that the office bearers are the product of some sinister cabal, or it's a sort of a closed shop, or even that it's merely because the congregation voted for a person or approved him, but that it is, since God is absolutely sovereign, it is by the will of God. It's even by the will of God if an office bearer is appointed for ill and the person's time in office results in bad things for the church. The will of God, his decree, and as we think and believe and understand that, you serve the sovereign will of God by fulfilling his will of command. Just like Paul did. And as we all must do too, by God's grace, faithfully. Amen.
Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, help us to hold fast to sound health-giving doctrine for it to refresh, encourage, uplift, and empower us. Help us to understand thy great work in the Apostle Paul. That he may be a good example to reprove, rebuke, exhort us, and enable us, Lord God, to be true and faithful. Forgive our many sins, our feelings, our transgressions of thy law in this regard to, and receive us mercifully. For Jesus Christ, our Lord's sake. Amen.